Jesse Goldberg Strasser with the Lug Nuts. And I'm joined now by a pitcher who was a Lug Nuts ace when he worked in Lansing. We're talking about the 2014 2015 seasons. Out of Long Beach, Chase DeYoung, it's good to see you again. Hey, Jess, good to see you too. So, first, what have you been up to? Well, much like everybody else, I've been sitting at home, just, you know, staying here, waiting for this whole uh, virus thing to, you know, whatever, flatten the curve and everything like that. Just been staying home, being with family, uh, doing a lot of the odd jobs around the house, like everybody else. <laughs> Where were you when everything was shut down? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think now. I, I was here. I, I've been in Southern California this entire time. Um, coming to you live from my backyard slash home gym slash you know, dinner area, everything. <laughs> it's a multi-purpose area back here right now. Let's go back to when you were with the Lansing Lugnuts. So we're talking six years ago first in 2014. What do you remember of that first season in Lansing? Yeah, I, I have a lot of fond memories of Lansing. Um, I also had two very different seasons when I was there. In 2014, I was 20 years old, uh, a young prospect, uh, going to my first full season team. Uh, I can remember showing up to the ballpark for you know those first couple practices, media day, photos, things like that, and thinking, wow, this is a really nice stadium. Uh, I had had... Um, experienced there before with a crosstown showdown in 2013 that was a lot of fun and i thought man this is this is what a ball's like this is a packed house this and that and then you know you have your first couple games in april and you realize oh okay it it'll get there but you gotta you gotta grind through the cold for a little bit first um that 2014 season i learned a lot uh i took a lot of hits because it i wasn't very good uh, I remember, I think I, forgive me, this is a couple of years ago now, but I'm pretty sure I went like one in six or one in eight or something. And my first win was actually in my last start before getting shut down in, I think it was August. And uh, so I, I really had to learn how to grind and know what it was to trust in a five day routine and, you know, not rely so much on the results of, you know, getting wins or things like that. Um, I can remember vividly in that 2014 season sitting down with my then pitching coach Vince Horseman and Vince is one to be pretty blunt. He'll tell you what he thinks and, and that's a great thing. And I've always appreciated being, you know, shot straight. And this was after a start. I don't remember which start, but it wasn't a very good one. I didn't do my job. I didn't get deep into the game, and I didn't take care of, you know, keeping the other offense at bay. And Vinny sat me down. He said, listen, Chase, you were terrible yesterday. And I was you know, 20 years old. I'm a prospect. I'm like, yeah, you're not supposed to tell me that. And he goes, listen, you were terrible yesterday. Doesn't mean you're a terrible pitcher. Just means you were terrible yesterday. So what are we going to do in these next couple days to make sure you are better than yesterday? And, and that always stuck with me. It was like, okay, listen, take what you did yesterday, analyze what you did, and now this game's all about making adjustments. So sitting there at 20 years old and having someone – because at that point in my life, I was never told I was terrible. I'd, I'd succeeded all the way up until that point. But Vinny, you know, didn't sugarcoat anything. He sat me down and I said, listen – this isn't working. You need to you need to make adjustments here. You need to learn how to pitch to a full lineup. You can't just throw fastballs by guys and throw, you know, 55 foot curveballs. It's not gonna work. So then, you know, we started learning to learn to change up and learn how to pitch to contact early in the count, you know, picking through a lineup, things like that. So Vinny was a tremendous help to me that year. Um, wasn't able to figure it out by the end of that season, but then going into that instructional league with the Blue Jays, I was, I was phenomenal. I did really, really well. Uh, going into the next spring training, I was hoping, you know, that off of my performance during instructional league that I would be able to advance to Dunedin, but that wasn't the case. Like, you know, I was then sent back to Lansing and I can tell you that that was probably the best thing for me because it was, 
instrumental in who I became as a pitcher, and much of that was due to South Asano then becoming the pitching coordinator. I can remember going to mini camp in spring training of 2015, and this was right after Sal got the pitching coordinator job, and everybody's thinking, okay, we just gave our pitching coordinator job to a career catcher. And some people were thinking, you know, maybe that's not the best idea. But if you think about it, it's a phenomenal idea. And the first meeting he had was with me. He pulled me in in minicamp and we sat in his office and he looked at me and he said, Chase, you're, you're going to be my project. I said, okay, well, at least, you know, somebody's paying attention. And he said, I'm, I'm the best pitching coach for you. I'm the best pitching coordinator for you. And I said, okay, well, why is that? And he sat me down. And he said, because I know nothing about mechanics. He said, and you, he goes, you're six foot four, you're 195, 200 pounds. He looked at me, he said, can you dunk a basketball? I said, yes, confidently. <laughs> and then uh, he said, and I, I've seen you work, you know, PFPs off the mound. I, you can field your position you know, very well. You're, you're athletic. He said, yeah. He goes, you don't look it at all when you're on the mound doing your delivery. He said, you're way too mechanical. We need to, he said, I think he said something in Italian because that's very Sal, but he said, we need to get you some style. We need to have you out there and being Chase, not a Iron Mike robot, how many strikes can I throw? And that's when he sat me down and he said, I'm the best pitching coordinator for you because I don't know about mechanics, but I sat back there for, you know, 12, 15 years, and I know how to get guys out. And he, he said, listen, I need you to buy into this with me because I think this is the one thing that's keeping you from being a really successful pitcher. So sure enough, then I started working with, it was Sal, Vince Horseman, and then uh, Jeff Ware because he was going to be the pitching coach in Lansing. So the, the three of them collectively, you know, took me on field one there in Dunedin, kind of that backfield way out there. And they said, all right, we want you to throw the ball how you want to throw the ball, talking about mechanically. And I'd always gotten the um, player comparison to Adam Wainwright. And I knew I needed to do something with my hands to generate some type of rhythm. And if you remember, and this was a long time ago for you as well, but my first year I was, I was very, you know, I looked like I had a coat hanger in the back of my jersey when I was pitching. And then the next year I came up, you know, with the over the head kind of old school delivery. And that was through Sal, Vinny, and Jeff that we, we developed that and we used that spring training. And it wasn't great right away, but sure enough, after a couple weeks of working with it, I had style. I had, I had my presence to the mound. And, and like you know, that 2015 season for me was completely opposite of what I was dealing with in 2014. I was very good. Uh, I, was, I threw the ball really well. I can remember the the good games that I had that year prior to eventually getting traded um but yeah the the confidence that I was given from those three men working with me that year in 2015 catapulted me through the next couple of years of my career and it it's something that I've I have thanked them for uh in years past after that happened I've, I've talked to all of them and um yeah I mean it, it was incredible Jeff Ware was the first person to sit me down and in, in that 2015 year and show me a slider because I'd only been a three pitch person with fastball curveball changeup, showing me that slider and it helped me be much more effective on righties because I'm able to you know expand that part of the zone off the plate and yeah being a lug nut was very beneficial to me in my career, and it helped me tremendously get through the minor leagues and ultimately to the big leagues. That difference that you mentioned between 2014 and 2015. So there's internal for you, but externally around you, 2014 went 62 and 77. And there were some fascinating individual stories that I might want to bring up later. But 2015, in addition to you, and the other guys in that starting rotation, like a Sean Reed Foley or a Connor Green or a Jesus Tinoco and right on down. The starting lineup has produced so many major leaguers, too. That 2015 team goes out there and wins the Midwest League Eastern Division title because you were on the mound throwing a complete game against Brent Honeywell of Bowling Green. 
How good was that team? That was a really fun team. Um, there were – that 2015 team, we knew we were good. We knew um, – not only did we have the talent, but we meshed together very well. That was a group that in those uh, instructional leagues and mini camps, we meshed together um, – so well and it was just so much fun to go to the ballpark every day with those guys and you'll find that as a consistent uh thing amongst pretty much every good team is that team chemistry and that you know locker room you know it it's a a well-oiled machine and we knew with the starting rotation that we had going out there we had a chance to win every night we knew that our defense was good and we could hit the ball you know i think that's year you know we had you know we had Rowdy Telez and Ryan McBroom that year. That's, you know, I remember watching batting practice there, and I've since watched a lot of batting practice, and seeing those two guys hit in the same lineup, I mean, that's, that's a really good one-two power punch there. And both of those guys have become, you know, phenomenal players like we all thought they would. Um, I can remember the game that you're talking about, and I remember our – manager at the time was uh Ken Huckabee and he had pulled everybody in prior to the game now as a starting pitcher you know I would get there for a seven o'clock game I'd get there around three thirty, maybe four o'clock because I had the morning to myself I didn't have to be at practice anything like that so I you know had a lunch I remember uh coming to the ballpark and everybody was kind of quiet and everybody was kind of you know leaving me alone, which isn't unusual as a starting pitcher, but I'm not like that. I talk to everybody. I, you know, enjoy being with my team. And apparently I didn't know this prior to the game, but Huck brought everybody in. He he told everybody about what could happen if we won tonight. And if we, you know, if we go out there and do well, you know, we, we clinch and we win. I didn't know. I, I, he didn't talk to me because he didn't want to apply that much more pressure on me and you know go out and I can't remember I think it was Danny Jansen catching me and I mean we we threw the ball so well that night and it was so much fun I knew you know going later in the game later in the game I knew I had a chance to to finish what I'm going to start here and you know there wasn't any way I wanted to come out of that game I can remember getting the final out and when we were going through the high five line, things like that. And I I've seen the video since, and I can still feel it when Huck grabs me and hugs me because the man has, you know, hands that are like an old catcher's man. I mean, they're thick and he's a strong man. He hugged me so tight. And I mean, it was just, it was a really fun moment. And that's something that I'm going to have forever. About Danny Jansen. Now he is the blue Jays catcher. He's the Jays number one catcher. Did you realize then, working with him as a battery, how good he could become? I knew a lot of the catching guys were high on him. Uh, you know, Huckabee was, Sal was, um, gosh, who was the, I think Snyder was the catching coordinator that year. I can't remember, but all of the people who had developed very good catchers in the past were like, okay, we have another one. and And this is a – you know, this is a big Midwestern kid. He's strong. He's, he's got the perfect demeanor for it. He's, he's got the, the personality to be back there. And, you know, he comes out and he talks to you and he developed that confidence in himself to be able to come out and handle a pitching staff. And yeah, we all knew Jano um, was a wonderful defensive catcher and we loved throwing to him because of the size of a target we had back there. Um, the development that he has had in the last couple of years is you're just so happy to see that from a guy because he is, he's a wonderful guy and he deserves every, everything that he's gotten to this point. You brought the lug nuts up to that point and then you were promoted. And then the next thing that I knew, I found out from Tim LaCastro with the lug nuts because he and you were getting traded to the LA Dodgers. Where were you when you found out? I was in my buddy's apartment because I went to Dunedin. I was there for, I think, 10 days. I was supposed to make a start. And the day before my start, I was doing my sprints. And I planted, turned around. One of my cleats got 
you know, stuck in the, in the grass there in Dunedin. And I went to turn and I tweaked my back. I strained a little muscle in my back and this in hindsight, you can, I can kind of see it now, but then it was okay. You know, I had the trainer come out, we were doing some exercises, he was working on it. It was still locked up. I left the field that day being day to day. I wasn't going to start tomorrow, but maybe in, you know, two days, if it let go, then, you know, I would be back on the mound. I come in the next day and my manager, Omar, comes up to me and says, you're shut down. You're on the seven day DL. You have a doctor's appointment at this time and you have acupuncture after that. And I was just taken away at, I was told I was day to day. Now I come down DL, doctor's appointment, MRI, um, acupuncture. And I was like, that's strange. So, and then Omar told me, this isn't my decision. This is coming from way up top and come, come to find out that I was on the trading block at that point. That was, uh, to confirm that it wasn't anything serious, that it was just a, a muscle tweak and that I was still in the trade to go to the Dodgers. So I actually never pitched for the Dunedin Blue Jays, even though I was there for 10 days. Um, which in talking to a lot of my friends, that's apparently the best way to go about the Florida State League. <laughs> With the trade, did you understand what you were getting traded for? I asked. I can remember, um, oh, my gosh, Charlie uh, – what was Charlie's last name? Charlie Wilson. Thank you. Charlie Wilson called me, and I remember him talking to me and said, Chase, you know, we – uh, we appreciate everything you've done. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what the heck? What happened? And uh, he goes, I, I just want to inform you that, you know, this is a good thing. Uh, this is part of baseball. This is the business side of it. But we've just traded you to the LA Dodgers. And I was like, oh my gosh, are, are, you, are you serious? And he goes, yes. And, you know, this, this is it. We would like you to go to the field, this and that. And then at the end of the phone call, he goes, aren't you from out there? I said, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool for me. And uh, I ended up, I did, I asked, I said, am I allowed to know what I've been traded for? And he said, you know, the, the full, um, what is it? The full details of the trade haven't been uh, given yet, but you will know by the end of it. And uh, I think that Blue Jays fans should be very um, grateful for the fact that the international slot money that Tim LaCastro and I were traded for helped end up signing Vladimir Guerrero Jr. So to all Blue Jays fans, you're welcome for that. And I know that was a very good trade for you guys. <laughs> Is that something that you followed his progress going, all right, you trade me away. Let's see how this guy turns out. Yeah, I faced him in AAA in 2018. I got him out three times and I struck him out. So I haven't faced him in the big leagues yet, but he's, uh, he's in the book, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now you're in the Dodgers system and you pitch well in the Dodgers system. In 2016 with Tulsa, you're outstanding. 14 and 5, a 286 ERA, and then up to Triple A for the very end of the year for one good start, eight strikeouts, one run, five and a third innings. And then you head into 2017 and you get traded again. You get traded on March the 1st, if I've got this right. So right yeah, I did at the start of spring training. I didn't know you could be traded in spring training. Uh, that was that was a shock to me. I also, I got added to the 40-man roster, so I, I was thinking I didn't know the full details of that because that, that's the higher end of baseball. And I was thinking, well, am I now on their 40-man roster? Am I, so there was a lot of variables for me. And I remember being told um, by Farhan – uh, Zaidi that uh, he said, you know, you, you've done phenomenal for me, for us. And, you know, we don't, we don't want to trade you. And I'm thinking, okay, then don't. But they said, this is, this is Seattle um, pursuing you for multiple years. And this is them giving us an offer. We can't refuse and we're going to trade you. And once they said Seattle, my first reaction was, okay, I'm not leaving here to go to Florida. They're up the street in spring training. So I didn't have to move my apartment. I didn't have to do 
you know, any of that, those things, I just showed up to the Peoria, Peoria sports complex um, with my Dodgers bag saying, hi, I've just been traded. And they're like, yeah, we're expecting you. And they showed me to my locker. And actually the first person I walked into the um, complex that I saw was a guy who I'd met with the Blue Jays was Danny Valencia. So it was nice to see a, you know, a face that I'd seen before. And I was like, Hey Danny, my name's Chase. I was at the low levels of the Blue Jays when you were in the big leagues, but I did cross paths with him in a spring training before. And I said, do you know where I'm supposed to go? And he pointed me in the right direction and got me to talk to the right people. So that was nice. And then I was a Seattle Mariner. A month later, yep. you're pitching in the major leagues, making your major league debut. Yeah. It was pretty funny because when I got traded to Seattle, um, nobody really knew who I was. Um, I've always had the demeanor of presenting myself as more mature than my age. Um, so there I was, 23 years old, um, on the roster for the first time I get traded to Seattle. And I, I pitched in that spring training. I don't remember everything from it, but I do remember I got optioned. I was down in minor league camp for just a little while. And then I was packing up my apartment in spring training in 2017. Um, oh, this is funny. Actually, in 2017, my apartment in spring training, I lived with um, other guys from the Blue Jays. So the apartment that I lived in in 2017 was myself, Colton Turner, who had then been traded to the White Sox for Deanna Navarro. Matt Smoral, who is a, a minor league rule five pick to the Rangers, and Brady Dragmeyer, who was claimed by the Rangers. So all of us Blue Jays, ex-Blue Jays, were living in an apartment together in Peoria, Arizona during that spring training. We were packing up the apartment. I remember I was taking my uh, Wi-Fi router back to the store to you know return it, and I get a phone call from... Um, the farm director for the Mariners, which is Andy McKay. And he calls me and said, Hey, this was right after uh, he told me that morning, Hey, um, you're going to be the opening day starter in Tacoma. And I thought, Oh, you know, that's really cool. Anytime you get an opening day nod, that that's a nice thing. I told my parents who were driving from Southern California to Arizona, um, they were driving out there. I said, Hey, uh, I'm, I'm the opening day starter in Tacoma. My, fiance at the time and my mom were going to take my car and drive it to Tacoma and they were on their way I'm now I'm back on the phone with Andy and he said hey um Chase I got some bad news uh you're actually not the opening day starter in Tacoma anymore and I thought gosh you just told me that I told my family you know they're coming to watch me pitch the last game of spring training tomorrow um and he said well the good news is, is that you're you're not going to be the opening day starter and it's for a good reason you're going to the big leagues and mind you Jesse this was April 1st and I had to get like confirmation from him I said hey I, I need you to know what the date is today because I have heard that pranks like this happen he said this is 100% serious do you have a sport coat uh pack your things a flight you're on the team flight tomorrow going to Houston and I didn't tell my parents. I texted my fiance at the time and they're, you know, on I-10 heading, heading east to Phoenix. So we go to dinner that night and uh, we were at, I think we went to BJ's Pizza and Colton Turner was actually there and he knew. I waited till, you know, the entrees arrived and I told, I told him, I said, hey, I'm actually not uh, the opening day starter in Tacoma anymore. I'm going to the big leagues tomorrow. And Colton was actually recording it on his phone. My mom started crying. My dad was just like, are you, are you serious? Are you kidding me? This So I got that incredible moment with my family. Uh, just, yeah, that, that was an awesome day. Colton, by the way, is one of my favorite guys who's ever come through Lansing. Yeah, phenomenal. I just have to ask. It's 2017. You're making your debut. You're pitching in Houston. Yep. 
What are your thoughts on all the news that has come out about the Houston Astros? Yeah, I, uh, I've processed that a lot. Um, there have been a lot of people that have reached out to me with, you know, the findings of that and say that, you know, I officially get to put a big asterisk next to my debut because of this, you know, the circumstances. And I am, I am the first and only Seattle Mariner to get walked off in their debut. Uh, I, I handled it well. Obviously, it was a really tough uh, pill to swallow. But I can remember the interview I gave after that game. You know, they, they're they interviewing me, and it, they were asking me questions. And I said, yeah, obviously, this hurts. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I feel like I let my team down. Uh, this, this isn't the way you want to start a season. But I did say – but at the end of the day, I've been working my whole life to do this, and I just pitched in the big leagues, and it's still a pretty cool experience. And I had other teammates come up to me, veteran guys that were like, you handled that incredibly well. So, You've since made 12 career major league appearances, seven with Seattle, and then five with the Minnesota Twins after you were traded to the Twins. Yeah. What is it like being in the major leagues? You know, it's everything that you dream it is, and then even more because there's some things you didn't know about that are there that are just, you know, icing on the cake. Uh, putting on a big league uniform is something that you can't take for granted. Uh, every time you do it, you need to appreciate it because you don't know how long it's going to last. You could play for, you know, 15 years, or this could be your last day. Um, so I, I tried to, to do that every day I was there. And, yeah, it was, it was incredible. Um, you know, the Minnesota Twins was a phenomenal organization. I loved being there. Uh, quite frankly, I wish I pitched better last season and I could still be there uh, working on getting back right now. But, I mean, what an incredible opportunity that I, I have had in my career to be able to play for – you know, two major league organizations. And um, yeah, it, it's a blessing. And it's something that, like I said, I'm definitely working to get back to because I know I can. So the last transaction that I see about you was last July, you were released by the twins. And you just said you're working to get back. Coronavirus has paused everything right now. So it's thrown monkey wrenches into everybody's plans. Yep. Where are you right now in terms of that plan to get back? Uh, I'm working out. I am, you know, trying to, I've been doing a lot of stuff by myself. I've been trying to, you know, get myself back, uh, doing a lot of mechanical work. I obviously can't play catch with other people. So I have, you know, weighted plyo balls and I am throwing them against the brick wall of the highway in my neighborhood. So my neighbors understand that this isn't just a grown man out there throwing a ball. This is actually my profession. Um, so that I have very understanding neighbors, which is nice. Um, I, I pitched poorly last year. I had my one appearance in the big leagues, and then my time in Rochester was not good. Um, due to, you know, choices I made, it was – I just – I tried to pitch at the top of the zone all the time because the, um, the data showed that the characteristics of my fastball play really well up there. And, you know, I didn't execute that well. And I didn't adjust that well. So got released, uh, took a contract to go play in Sugarland, and gave me the opportunity to internalize how I pitch and how I want to throw the ball. And I went down there and I, I had a couple of bad games, but I got back and I was me again for, for times there, which was really good. I uh, wasn't able to get anybody to sign me an affiliated ball this past off season. I guess it's still currently the off season, kind of. Uh, so I did. I signed back to go down to Sugarland, and you know, I'm I'm throwing the ball well again. I worked out with uh, Long Beach State and Golden West College while I was here. I was throwing against their guys. I was I was me again. I was you know, 90, 92. Got a curveball. Got a slider. Got a changeup. So I'm once this season starts, I am very much looking forward to getting out there and you know proving to everyone and proving to myself that I'm still a very good pitcher and I'm still a very good big league pitcher. Um, as far as what I'm doing right now is I'm just preparing myself for once that gate is open that I'm ready to sprint to the finish line. 
It's interesting to me, the idea of here's what the data shows. Because you have pitched around, we saw you in Lansing in 2014, you entered the pro ranks before that in Bluefield the year prior. Uh, prior. Chase, you've been through this evolution of how analytics can help a player understand his spin rate or where he's effective or ineffective. How do you currently understand pitching? My personal beliefs are you need to be able to use them at the data and analytics. You need to be able to use them as a tool and not, not as so cut and dry. I have, I was presented with the fact that, um, well, when I first got traded to the twins, I got there and, um, they told me, Hey, you throw your two seam fastball, uh, 11% of the time and it gets hit harder than any other pitch you throw. So we don't think it's as effective as you think it is. And we would like you to scrap it and optimize your four other pitches that produce, you know, quality results. And that being sat down and, and shown that I was like, yeah, absolutely. I can't argue with that. I stopped throwing my two seam fastball. Now going to last year um, in spring training, I was told, Hey, um, your four seam fastball has the unique characteristic of, I have, I didn't have super above average spin rate, but I have carry. I was a carry guy. The average vertical break on my fastball was I want to say between 19 and a half and 21 and a half inches of vertical break, which is you're categorized as a carry guy. So pitch at the top of the zone. Um, by the way, the first person I ever heard of that pitched better at the top of the zone than the bottom of the zone was a guy named Danny Rollins, who was Lugna. And Vince was the first person that told him that. He said, listen, you get crushed at the bottom of the zone and you're really good at the top of the zone. Because like anyone who lives in the Blue Jays organization from 2010 to 2014, that was pound down university. You threw the ball, fastballs at the bottom of the zone. And, you know, I have since played with guys like Justin Nicolino and things like guys like that. And it's like, yeah, that's what we did. You know how to throw fastballs at the bottom of the zone. Well, then the twins were like, hey, no, we don't want you to do that. We want you to throw fastballs at the top of the zone. And for me, the strength that I have had is that I can, I need to be able to throw any pitch at any time. Um, so just throwing fastballs at the top of the zone. I needed to be able to use it, optimize it as a weapon and not the only thing I do because it didn't, I didn't do it well enough that I could just live there and throwing 90 mile an hour fastballs up in the zone. If I'm not perfect, that ball goes a long way. Well, very clearly, if you look at my numbers, I was not perfect last year and that ball went a long ways. Um, so for me, looking at the data, I need to be able to optimize my best pitches as weapons, but not live in, not just live at the top of the zone, my fastball. I need to be able to locate a fastball down. So that way it plays off of my slider and off of my changeup. Because the only thing that tunnels off of that high fastball for me is my curveball. So I understand that the data says, you know, you get hit, you know, 80 points higher when you throw your fastball at the bottom of the zone. I understand that, but I still need to be able to locate that down so it matches my off-speed pitches down. So then, you know, I want them to be able to hit my fastball down and away. And I want them to be committed to that because my off-speed pitches are presented like that, but then obviously are slightly different at the end. But I need that commitment and that aggressiveness out of the hitter to attack that pitch. And then the cat and mouse or the chess game is – it was a changeup. It was a slider, but you were committed to the fastball. So that's where I went wrong last year is I tried to pitch to the data and just throw, you know, vertical carry fastballs at the top of the zone. I walked more guys last year in my career than I had ever before in, in innings because I was trying to do that and I was just missing up, missing up. And, you know, all of a sudden now you're two Oh, two, one, three, one to everybody. It's really hard to pitch behind the count. I tried it last year. It doesn't work very well. Let me finish off by asking you about a couple of guys who, uh, they were Lugnuts teammates of yours. Okay. 2014, you start the season with the Lansing Lugnuts. 
2014, Kendall Graveman starts the season as the Lugnuts number four, number five starter. And he's in the major leagues before the year is over. <laughs> what was it like watching a teammate of yours go from single A to the major leagues? We were so happy for him. I can remember he threw almost, was it almost a perfect game or almost a no hitter in Beloit? And I mean, after that, we were like, okay, Kendall's, Kendall's not going to be around here very much longer. And I remember having a conversation with uh, Paul Quantrill and he was the one who, you know, he said he was the guy saying, this guy's ready. You gotta, you gotta let him go. You gotta let him pitch. He said, he told me during that season, he said, this guy's ready to pitch in triple A when he was in low A and high A. And he said that, you know, I think he's ready to pitch in triple A depending on what he does there. He could be ready for the big leagues. And he was spot on, you know, I don't think anybody could have told you that they saw that he was going to develop a cutter and four miles an hour on his fastball, but he did, you know, and Kendall was, Kendall was and is a very good pitcher and yeah, everybody on that team liked him and everybody on that team was very happy for him too. Another guy on that 2014 team who was not around very long. In 2012 in the Gulf Coast League, Anthony Alford played five games as your teammate. Mm -hmm. So 2014, I'd never seen Anthony Alford play before, but here it comes in for five days before going right back out to football. And those five games were so much fun. And then we got to have him around full time in 2015. What was it like playing with Anthony? He, he was one of the first people I'd ever seen that where I said, this guy is just physically built different than other people. I had seen guys who were fast, much like a guy on that team, DJ Davis. You know, DJ was supposed to be the fastest guy in the draft in 2012. And DJ was lightning fast. But the way they ran was different. I've always said, you know, DJ ran – and he just kind of floated, like just just smooth like that. Anthony ran like a football player. Anthony ran like he was moving the earth underneath him. And it was impressive to see a guy, his frame, and if you remember, when he came back from football, he was big. Like he, he was big and strong, and, you know, I think they wanted him to trim down a little bit, but – I'd never seen somebody, you know, 6'2", 215, 225 moving like that. I mean, it, it was remarkable. And you could just see the raw ability that he had. And, I mean, I can remember all of a sudden in low A when Anthony came, all of a sudden Alex Anthopoulos was in the building. And it was, we need to sit down and have a meeting with you because we would like you to just play baseball. and. I think Anthony would be the one to tell you that it was a good choice. <laughs> Another guy who was not around very long, and we didn't know too much about. Miguel Castro joined the Lugnuts at the very end of the year. It's, the funny thing to me is in 2014, the Lugnuts were 62 and 77. And there were all these stories throughout the year that I found fascinating. Miguel Castro is with the Lugnuts at the very end of the year, and in the next year, he's in the major leagues. What did you see from Miguel, now Major League reliever with the Orioles? What we saw was 97 to 99 and an 83 mile an hour curveball, an actual, like it had that much break. And you're like, okay, first off, this man looks like Kevin Durant. And second off, this is phenomenal. Like, we all thought, okay, what's he doing here? Why is this man in low A where this is clearly a premier big league reliever? And, you know, sure enough, he was. And I remember that spring training where him and Roberto Osuna made the club out of high A as non-roster invites. And everybody was thinking, no way, no way. And then all of a sudden now it's like, oh, yep, they were right. They were absolutely right to be there because, you know, Roberto was a you know big league closer and Miguel is a phenomenal back end of the bullpen arm. Final guy I want to ask you about was the guy that you were traded to the Dodgers with. Tim LaCastro was maligned for not having a very good arm. What were his plus tools? What could he do? But Ken Huckabee told me early on, this is the magic man. Watch for him. And now he's in the major leagues as a folk hero. What was it like having Timmy as a teammate? <laughs> he, 
he's a really fun guy. Uh, I have enjoyed being around him. He's, he's different, but you know, you would think that a guy who leads, you know, the minor leagues and getting hit by pitches would be a little bit different. And he is, uh, he, he's a phenomenal teammate and a guy I'm lucky to call a friend. Uh, when we got traded together, he, he showed up and we both went to Rancho Cucamonga and he didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody, but I said, Hey, I don't live that far from here. It's about a 45 minute drive, but if I have carpool, we can make it quicker. I said, you can just live with me. So he said, that would be great. So he, you know, lived at my house with me and my family and we, uh, yeah, we had a, we had a great run together and playing together in Rancho and then, uh, Tulsa too. I mean, he's, the guy can flat out hit. He can put the bat on the ball and he knows, he knows that, you know, being fast is one of his tools and puts the ball on the ground and runs like hell. <laughs> Had you seen a guy get hit by pitches like he gets hit by pitches before? No. <laughs> I mean, he, he enjoyed it and it, it was impressive. And I've done a couple interviews since with being traded with him that, guys have asked me like have you ever looked up his d3 numbers at Ithaca College and I said well no I don't I don't look up guys numbers that I played with I, I look what he does now like no go look him up he's like a, a you're right he's like a folklore hero legend from d3 baseball and it was really cool to see that because he he didn't tell us you don't come in the locker room and say oh yeah I'm you know d3 baseball's Babe Ruth it's like but to me <laughs> Timmy's an incredible person. And lastly, with Chase DeYoung, any weird memories from Lansing? Any stories that occurred in Lansing in 2014 or 2015, or even at the Crosstown Showdown, that is always stuck in your head is, this is not something I ever remember seeing before, and I'm never going to see this again. Yeah, I, I, you talked to me a couple of days ago, asking me to come on. I've been, that's what I've been thinking of, is fun stories from Lansing. And I can remember in 2014, we go um, early in the season, we go to Appleton and Beloit. And we get to Appleton, I want to say it was like a Thursday night late. Um, we woke up to plenty of snow to the point where we woke up and we're like, yeah, we're not playing. We're for sure not playing today. We're probably not playing tomorrow. And so sure enough, Friday, we don't play. Uh, the next day, well, I can remember going out behind the hotel myself, Jorge Saez, um, a couple of other warm climate kids went and built a snowman because, you know, I'm from California, Jorge's from Hylia, Florida, and I think a couple of the Latin guys were out there too because they'd never seen snow. And um, we built a snowman back in the hotel. This was one of my favorite stories, and I'm still very good friends with a few of these guys, so it's, it's okay that I tell it. But people who aren't from cold weather climates don't understand that a couple of days after it snows, you know, it's still cold and it's not going away. So they push it all to that, you know, overflow lot or that empty part of the parking lot, and it looks terrible. You know, it's, it's all gross and dirty and this and that. Well, I can remember Mark Leeper, the bus driver, dropping us off at a mall for us to all go, you know, get out of the hotel, get something to eat, whatever we need to do. And I can remember Alberto Torado, Adonis Cardona, and I can't remember who else, but a couple of the Latin guys, one from Venezuela, one from the Dominican, asked us, and, you know, I had both broken Spanish, they had broken English. They said, you know, why is that snow like that? And being the quick thinker that I am, I said, oh, that's, that's black snow. And they were confused. And I said, yeah, white snow falls during the day and black snow falls during the night. So sure enough, we, <laughs> we had them up on top of this pile of, you know, pushed up snow with leaves and dirt in it. And they were taking photos and telling their family, oh, black snow. And a couple of days later, we, we let them know, we're like, hey, I was pulling your leg. That was just a, a joke. And, and they, they got me back, and it was funny. And I can remember, actually, on that trip, I was Adonis's throwing partner. And, you know, if you remember him, he had an unbelievable fastball. And, you know, he's a very good pitcher. 
we were practicing in Beloit on that Saturday that we couldn't play, and it was high 20s, low 30s, and we get done playing catch, and he goes, okay, flat ground. And I was like, yeah, all right, I'm not catching 97 with no gear and, and 30 degrees. He goes, no, 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 I need to throw flat ground. I was like, oh, my God. So there I am in a squat. You know, I caught, like, three fastballs, which were probably, you know, 93, 94, just easy. And I then asked Ryan Maydell, I said, hey, I'm going to get hurt. Will you catch this? And he said, yeah. And he loved it. Snake loved catching bullpen. So he grabbed his catcher's glove, and he caught it. And so I think that was him getting back at me. I was wondering how they got back at you. Yeah, they did. They did. Any other stories that you wanted to share that you remembered? Uh, one of my favorite ones was that very long bus trip to Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, in the 2015 season, we had a resident from Bowling Green, Mark Biggs, uh, was born and raised in Bowling Green. And I can remember we got, we got into town at maybe five, six in the morning, something like that. The sun was barely coming up and, you know, that's the back end of a, you know, 10 hour bus trip. And everybody's sleeping. We're just trying to get to the hotel. Well, Mark, who just showed up to his hometown, playing against his hometown team at 6 in the morning, also showing up, and he hadn't seen his wife in a long time, and now he's showing up home, woke everybody up on the bus prior to getting to the hotel, said, wake up, everybody. This is God's country here. This is Bowling Green, Kentucky, best place on earth. And everybody woke up because Mark had this big, booming, baritone voice, and he, he let us all know that he was home and we were all happy for him. But at that moment, I'm pretty sure a couple guys threw their pillows at him and said, be quiet. We'll talk to you later. And so that was another good lug nut story. Chase, I love it. This has been so good catching up with you. Thank you very much for giving of your time. Absolutely, Jess. I appreciate you. Thank you.